Okay, good morning. We are at the Glenlee Long-Term Rotation Study on July 8th, 2022. And uh, thank you for taking a moment to watch this video of our work. My name is Martin Entz. I'm a professor in the Department of Plant Science at the University of Manitoba. So we have been making videos of our long-term study for a number of years. And each year we try to emphasize something different. This year, we're going to be showing you our conventional and organic crops earlier in the season. Um, and then we'll uh, uh, show you what they look like when they become more mature. Um, one of the changes in at Glenlee is uh, behind me, we've been able to secure a better quality cedar for our research. And uh, this has made a real difference in the quality of our crop establishment, both in the conventional and in the organic plots. And a little bit later on, I'll show you our inter-row inter inter cultivator that matches this unit, which has offered some new opportunities for weed control in organic management. So uh, welcome. Um, and uh, we're uh, just about to start looking at the crops and uh, we'll shift over to take a look at some conventional crops for starters. Here we are in front of the um, conventionally managed plots in the grain only farming system. So this rotation is flax, the wheat, uh, then flax, then oats, and then soybean. And I, we're looking here at the flax crop and at the oat crop managed conventionally. So um, the oats look typical for this time of year and the flax also looks quite typical. Um, the management of this conventional system is that uh, we test the soil for nutrients and then we apply to soil test recommendations. And, um, uh, and then of course the, tr the crops are sprayed with pesticides to look after weeds and other pests. So, um, uh, in a long-term study like this, it's, it's important to have the comparison of the conventional treatment. And, uh, and here you can see that it looks really quite typical. One uh, thing of note here is the variety of wheat that we are growing is AAC Starbuck, which is the newest um, Ag Canada semi-dwarf fusarium tolerant variety for this region of uh, the prairies. And uh, in the organic, we're actually growing an organically bred uh, wheat variety. So we are growing varieties that are best adapted to the system. Here we're growing AAC Starbuck, and in the organic, we're growing a variety that was selected um, in organic management. Here we are in the grain-only rotation, but under organic management. And I'm, st I'm kneeled here in front of the oat plot and you can see that it is quite a very, quite a good crop of, of organic oats. And let's keep in mind that this is the 31st organic crop in this system. And why does this oat crop look so good? Well, one reason is that we've, uh, uh, I'll remind you about the rotation. So we have a green manure crop. We don't have soybeans in this organic system. We have a barley hairy vetch mix. Then we go to wheat, then we go to flax, and then we go to oats. So oats is three years after the green manure. Why does it still look so good in terms of nitrogen supply? Well, one reason is that the hairy vetch green manure provides a lot of nitrogen, a lot more than the old green manures that we used to use, like peas, which would really only grow for 70 days. Uh, and, and we have to be honest that another reason is that we had a drought last year and so uh, our crops didn't use a lot of nitrogen. This year uh, a lot of that nitrogen is being mineralized out of the organic matter. Now in terms of weed control it looks good and that's because we uh, used inter-row cultivation and if we have any thistles in here we'll use the comb cut. So we are using some standard organic mechanical weed control practices. And so we have a, a great crop of oats coming here. It, uh, it's um, in the uh, one, two, three, four, starting the fifth leaf, it'll probably, uh, it'll probably head out in, um, in seven to 10 days. We are a little bit behind uh, this year. That's because we had the flood and the very, very wet spring. And so our seeding was delayed a little bit. 
So there we have the organic oats and then we're going to shift over and take a look at the organic wheat and flax. Here we have the organic wheat uh, in the grain only rotation. Uh, you can see again a uh, nice looking crop, quite weed free, uh, good nitrogen supply. That's our wheat and this is a, an organically uh, developed variety uh, that we did uh, in a partnership with, the, uh, with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Uh, the Bout uh, uh, Family uh, Foundation for Canadian Seed Security and uh, a number of farmers who helped in the early generation selection. And uh, this is the second year that we've been growing actually organically bred varieties in the organic plots as opposed to growing conventional varieties over in the conventional. Here we are still in the organic grain only rotation. We're looking at the flax. Um, and uh, it looks fantastic. This is a, a very good flax crop. Now, uh, one thing that, that I want to point out here is the front half of the plot. Uh, the flax looks a bit bigger than the back half. And that's because uh, in this annual uh, rotation, we, um, we actually split the plots. And if you look at our website, you can learn about that, um, that intervention. So the, the front half of this plot uh, received uh, a five-year five year, uh, alfalfa crop and the back half didn't. And so we are looking at larger crops where uh, we now are back into the grain rotation after that five-year intervention with alfalfa. Uh, it is also supplying more nitrogen and that's one of the reasons why we have more weeds here. So nutrients don't only help the crop, they also help the weeds. Now just a comment, in our research it's very tempting to go in here and hand weed out this thistle or this uh, mustard, but we will not do that. I will not let my staff do that because um, we've gone through and done inter-row cultivation um, and, and that's all we're going to do here. That's really what an organic farmer would do and so we're just going to have to live with this weed pressure. Is it a big problem this year? Um, well, I don't think so. We've got a very healthy flax crop here and the mustard that's growing there and I believe there's a red root pigweed. No, there isn't. There's some wild buckwheat. The wild buckwheat is, is going to perhaps give us some challenges at harvest time. Uh, the, the mustard uh, is something that flax is usually able to compete with quite well because of its mycorrhizal nature. So anyways, there's a, a little overview early in the season on our organic um, grain-only rotation. At Glenlee, we have two different crop rotations that are both under conventional and organic. We have the grain-only rotation, which we just looked at, and then we have what we call the forage grain rotation. So two years of alfalfa, then wheat, and then flax. And what we're looking at here is the flax uh, growing in the conventional forage grain rotation. And you can see for yourselves how different the flax looks here where we have alfalfa in the rotation versus back there where we only have the, where we have flax on the grain only rotation. And you can come to some of your own conclusions on what are the benefits of putting a short term forage into a crop rotation. One of the other benefits of the forage is that our nitrogen requirements are about half where we, um, where we add the alfalfa in the rotation versus in our conventional grain only rotation. So here we are in the organic forage grain rotation in front of the flax. And um, you, can, you can see the flax looks, looks also quite excellent. And um, I, I have to say that my conclusion is that the flax this year looks better in the organic plots uh, versus the comparable conventional plots. And why is that? Why could that be? Is there any scientific reason for that? Well, we've done quite a bit of soil health work in this rotation. We've collaborated with the Soil Health Institute on a North American wide study and uh, where we had the opportunity to measure everything from soil carbon to soil enzymes to pH. And what we know about these organic rotations is that they have higher um, phosphorus um, um, 
phosphatase enzymes, enzymes that help plants and bacteria get phosphorus from the organic matter. And the flax plants tend to have a higher mycorrhizal colonization, although a, a, uh, we've documented that in the past and we have a new grad, graduate student who's going to be docu documenting that this year. That's what the flags are for. Um, so, so there you have it, the flax in the, in the grain only rotation, in the forage grain rotation. The front half of the plot receives manure. And that's why we tend to see um, a little bit more uh, wild mustard uh, activity in, in the manured uh, parts of these plots. And if you want to learn more about how we manage the manure, you can go to the website. So here we have the flax in our forage grain organic rotation. And then this is the wheat in the forage grain organic rotation. Um, let's talk about its growth. We can see that the front half of the plot, the wheat doesn't look as impressive as the back half of the plot. And that again relates to that manure story. We know that in the forage grain rotation where we're removing the alfalfa during those two years of forage, and then we grow wheat and then the flax, we have a phosphorus deficiency. And the front half of the plot here is where we have never added manure to the forage phase of this rotation. And the consequence is that the forage doesn't fix as much nitrogen, the legume forage doesn't fix as much nitrogen, and so the wheat crop is not as healthy. In terms of um, weeds, it also means somewhat fewer weeds in the crop because there's fewer nutrients also for the weeds. The back half of the plot is where we add um, phosphorus to the forage, to the alfalfa grass mixture, and that means a lot more nitrogen fixation. And if we look closely, uh, the yield potential of that is probably twice the yield potential of this, or even more. Now, one of the consequences of those nutrients are weeds. I talked about that before. And so we're gonna go to the back half of the plot, and I'm gonna demonstrate the plot size comb cut which is a tool that helps us control thistle in wheat. So what you just um, witnessed is the use of this plot size comb cut machine, which uh, uh, the concept was developed in Sweden for organic farms. And the idea is that these knives would go into the wheat crop and most of the wheat, although not all of it, uh, is just slides through the knives, but the hollow stemmed weeds like Canada thistle are cut off. And so they are uh, not eradicated, but the tops are cut off actually quite effectively. Um, so this is called the comb cut and it is um, one of the ways that we control try to suppress Canada thistle in cereals. Okay, good afternoon. It's uh, August 23rd, 2022. This is the second half of our Glenlee tour. My name is Martin Entz and I'm joined today by PhD candidate Michelle Karkner, who uh, is going to uh, join me in this walk around the Glenlee rotation. Hello, welcome, Michelle. Thank you very much, Martin. Okay, so uh, if you've uh, watched these Glenlee videos in the past, what we like to do is to go through the different crop rotations and just look at the crops. So this, Michelle, is the conventional grain-only rotation. So it has no perennial crops, just grains. And there's a rotation of wheat and then flax and then oats and then soybean and then back to wheat. So here we have the wheat. So um, I just wanted to let our viewers know that there are tire tracks through here that really don't represent the system. And that's because our our tractor made those tracks when we were uh, seeding. And this, this crop rotation has been no-tilled for the past three years, which is quite new for the Red River Valley, but it had been dry. And so we've been looking at no-till and I'll show you the drill later. So uh, now Michelle is working uh, with wheat adaptation. So I'm gonna turn the mic over to her and I'm gonna tell her to 
ask her to tell you a little bit about this wheat variety and then get her opinion on what she thinks it looks like. So uh, this year the team decided to seed a uh, Starbuck and that decision was based on what farmers are growing currently. It is like the latest, greatest uh, wheat variety that's very exciting to farmers across Manitoba. It has a uh, very good midge tolerance. It has uh, moderate resistance to FHB. It's a semi-dwarf, so it's pretty resistant to lodging. Um, so we always try to decide on what varieties to grow in the conventional and organic rotation according to what farmers would grow or what's most exciting, and, and that's what the team decided on this year. Okay, and what do you think of the crop? I think it looks really great. I mean, this year is, uh, it was a late seed, but at the same time, we've had pretty good precipitation, uh, which is pretty different from 2020 and 2021, so that's refreshing to see. Okay. Great, thanks, Michelle. Hey, let me show you the other crops in the rotation. So we're, uh, while our camera uh, swings around, um, and, uh, uh, we're looking here at the second crop in the conventional rotation. This is flax, and I think Michelle has identified some weeds in here already. Do you want to just point out what species you see? Yeah, so the majority of the weed problems that we have in this plot are wild oats. Uh, this plot is sprayed like any other conventional plot, but um, uh, we have wild oat resistance problems. Right, so we have uh, been struggling with the wild oat resistance in here for quite a while. This is the flax crop here, so if you put it down on your boot, we'll be looking at other crops, so it's just above your knee. And so it is, um, it is a bit of a short flax crop, and uh, it has been well fertilized, but um, one of the thoughts that I had is the flax in this rotation is struggling because of the excess water really hurt this crop early in the season. Um, Okay, so we're going to move on to the next crop in the rotation, which is oat. And uh, uh, this is uh, Surus oat. And um, Michelle, what do you think of the crop? Is it a bit short for oat? Yeah, I would say it's a bit short for oat. That could be because we seeded a bit late. It was pretty hot summer, but um, possibly moisture. I don't know. What do you think, Martin? Yeah, I think uh, I think that's true. I think the, that that moisture right after seeding uh, really hurt this crop, and it survived. And we are getting a crop, but it's probably not quite as big as it would have been had we just missed a couple of those really pounding rains mm. in the early spring. Mm. Now, then, our last crop in the rotation. Um, is one that I want to hear Michelle's comments on um, because this crop was also pounded with rain uh, early on. Um, Michelle, what do you think of our soybean crop? Yeah, I think it's a really great soybean crop. I don't know if you can see here, but it's about, you know, mid uh, hip for me. Uh, so, I mean, I remember during my master's when I was doing uh, organic soybean agronomy is that we were talking to farmers about including soybeans because they don't mind the moisture. They actually really like it. Uh, whereas uh, legumes such as uh, peas, they really don't like wet feet. But soybeans can handle it and I think this year is a perfect example of that. Right, I agree with you and uh, you know I, I, have, I heard a saying and many farmers know this that one of the things that makes good soybean crops is a good August rain. Mm. And, and, if, and we've definitely have had good August rains and we've got a beautiful crop. So among the three, four crops in our conventional grain only rotation, Michelle, which do you think has performed the best? Well, I think I would, um, you know, I would say the soybean looks the best for sure. And I would agree with you. I think this is a crop that really has been well adapted to the growing conditions here at Glenlee in 2022. Okay, so that's it for our conventional grain only rotation. We're going to take a quick break and go over and check our organic plots. Okay, so now we're standing in the grain only organic rotation. So this has a rotation of wheat, flax, uh, oats and a green manure. Uh, so we're standing in front of the, the wheat plot right now and uh, Martin, I'm noticing that the back half of the plot looks a lot healthier than the, the front half of the plot. Do you want to explain why that is? Okay, okay that's, a, that's a great observation. So this, um, uh, the front half of the plot is where wheat follows a hairy vetch green manure and the back half is where wheat follows uh, multiple years of alfalfa. And so what we did in this system, because we were suffering from wild oats, uh, we um, 
split the plots and used a wild oat killer, which is alfalfa, and that did solve a lot of our problem. Hey, why don't we move back there and take a closer look at it? I can, I can show you just how much better it looks. That's a great idea. Okay, so this, Michelle, is where we had multiple years of alfalfa, um, and uh, you can see how much better the wheat grows. Yeah. What, what, are, what is your thought about, about even the yield potential of this crop? Yeah, I think it looks great. Um, this is uh, an organic variety, so it's a bit taller than the semi-dwarf Starbuck that we had in the annual rotation. But it even looks um, a m much darker green and more vigorous than the front half of the plot. And, uh, you know, that just means its photosynthetic ability extends just a little bit longer throughout the season, right? So, um, yeah, it looks like it's going to be a really uh, healthy good yielding crop. And what do you think about the weed control in here? Well, I think from uh, the audience can agree that we don't have as much of a wild oat problem at this half of the plot than the other. Um, I believe, Martin, if you grab a weed, yeah, so here's a, you know, a pigweed and you can see that it's um, suffering quite a bit. So the wheat has been able to compete with the weeds quite a bit. You wouldn't know it, but there are weeds in here, but they look like this. Okay, so thanks for your astute observation. Now, what this might have somebody thinking about is that hairy vetch is not a particularly green manure, a particularly good green manure. Mm. But I should just let people know that we haven't been including the hairy vetch in here very long. It's only in the last few years, so the system has not quite caught up to benefiting from the hairy vetch. Um, Okay, so there's the wheat. Uh, let's just pan the camera over here, Michelle, and let me show you the, the green manure, because this rotation here in the annual system is um, a green manure, which is barley hairy vetch. We blade roll it, and then we grow the wheat, and then we grow flax, and then we grow oats, and then back to the hairy vetch. So your thoughts about hairy vetch? Well, I mean, the hairy vetch looks uh, really healthy. And it's got how many more uh, months left to grow? This well, year? I mean, it's the 23rd of August, so it's probably got at least six weeks of good photosynthesis. And uh, how would you uh, estimate how much nitrogen would be available for the following crop? Okay, so this hairy vetch, uh, we would anticipate, given the moisture we have, that it probably would produce uh, 6,000 pounds per acre of dry matter. Um, now, what we do is we multiply that by 2.5%. So, 6 times 2.5 is 150 pounds of nitrogen, if my math is correct. Mm -hmm. um, and people go, wow, that's a lot of nitrogen. I don't even put that much on my canola in my conventional system. But that is in what this is capable of producing. Uh, the last couple of years we've been dry. If people go back and watch the previous videos, it's very dry. We didn't get quite as much growth. Um, but you can always get 70, 80 pounds out of this, but we could easily grow a corn crop or a potato crop after this hairy vetch. There's enough nitrogen. Right. And so, uh, was this barley terminated somehow? Yeah, we did the blade roller on this, and some of the barley is still standing, but if you look at the middle, you can see it's crimped, and, uh, mm -hmm. and the hairy vetch will just climb up the barley and overtake it. And by freeze up, this will be a complete mat of hairy vetch, about that tall. Yeah. And so the uh, front half of that plot of the spring wheat uh, that had hairy vetch in it last year, um, that was might have also been poor hairy vetch growth last year. You know, thanks for reminding me about that. That's exactly what happened. We had a drought and we didn't have that great growth. So that also raises the question, what green manure should we grow if it's really dry? And, you know, we could pick other species like chickling vetch or even peas. Mm. Um, hairy vetch does like to have moisture. Mm. Now, some people don't like to grow hairy vetch because it becomes a volunteer problem. And you can see a few purple flowers through here. And if you are, um, you know, it, it can be managed. Um, if hairy vetch is seeded uh, in the springtime with the barley, it's not going to overwinter. So it'll be dead next year. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so... Um, so that's that part of the rotation, and after the wheat, we grow flax. So let's just walk across the hairy vetch plot here to our organic flax. So 
Um, while you uh, talk a little bit about what you think about the flax and the weeds in that half and that half, I'm going to pull at a plant and see how tall it is. Okay, so if we could span the camera this way. So you can see this half of the uh, plot has quite a bit more weeds than the other half of the plot. Um, why, do you, why is that, Martin? Well, remember that we did break the plots up. That had the annual green manure, and another half had alfalfa, so this half had the alfalfa, mm. and it's a wild oat killer. Mm-hmm. Now, do you want to just measure that against your knee again? <laughs> so, uh, to see if how much different it is than the conventional? It's quite a bit taller, I would say. I think it was, the conventional was about here. And that's quite remarkable that we actually have an organic flax crop that is taller than the conventional. And so we don't always have such success with our flax here, um, but this year the flax really looks quite good. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that, uh, that we uh, notice in organic production is that we do have a tolerance for weeds, right? And what, what would you say about that weed spectrum? Would you be worried about that as a farmer? When you go to organic farms, is that the kind of thing you see? Uh, yes, it is the kind of thing that I see, and I, I wouldn't say a lot of organic farmers would be worried about it. Um, the uh, competitiveness of the actual cash crop is quite good. Um, and so in terms of weed seed return, you know, I think if there was a, a large chunk of um, something like Canada thistle, that would be a concern, but um, the majority of these uh, weeds are won't be competitive in the next year, and uh, yeah, the weed pressure doesn't look too bad. Okay, thanks, and it's important for our audience to know that this is the 31st organic wheat crop on this piece of land. So this is, pl this is more than three decades of organic management in this exact rotation. And this is the last crop in the rotation, Michelle. This is again Surus oats, and uh, this front half here has had the alfalfa history. The back half hasn't. Um, the fact that the back. So, what do you think about the difference between the front half and the back half compared to like that wheat crop? Uh, I would say it's less dramatic, for sure. Um, the the back half you can tell that it's uh, a bit shorter and the yield potential is a bit lower than the front half but I would say it's less dramatic uh, than the wheat um, so that might possibly be because oats are better at scavenging nutrients yep. um, it might be that it's kind of I don't know what else um, better at you know handling um, lower nutrient sites so yeah and those, those are those are actually really good points because we do know that oats requires less nitrogen per bushel of oats than than wheat for example mm -hmm. and uh, a past graduate student um, uh, Pam Durockney she actually looked at the the rooting rooting pattern of, of oats versus wheat and roots do uh, oats do root deeper okay uh, and they use about you know a couple of centimeters more water okay. so and then this, this oat crop here, to my mind, this actually, I mean, we know it's taller than the conventional oats. To me, it looks a bit thicker. What's your honest assessment? Uh, yeah, I, I would say if I'm comparing it to the conventional oat plots that um, it, it looks healthier. It looks, the yield potential seems to look higher. I mean, it's lodging here, which is a, a sign of a good nutrient base and a good yield potential. Okay. All right, so that compares our, uh, our grain-only system in the conventional management and our grain-only system in the organic management. And we'll just end off uh, the crop part of our video by looking at our organic perennial rotation. Welcome back. We're standing in front of the perennial organic rotation, which is two years of alfalfa, wheat, and then flax. Uh, we're standing in front of, I believe, a first-year alfalfa crop. Correct. And... Uh, uh, was this cut prior? What was the timing of this? This has been cut twice this year, and it was just cut about 10 days ago or so. Yep. And yep. I'm seeing other species in here though, uh, not just alfalfa. What else do you have in here? Well, we have the uh, we have the alfalfa, and then we have red clover, which you can always tell by the little watermark on the leaves. Mm -hmm. And we have orchard grass in here as well and there should be some timothy as well so it's okay. a mixture of grasses and legumes okay and we put the red clover in because we're in a wetter area mm -hmm. so 
if we do get like super heavy rains, the alfalfa can drown out, but the red clover can handle that. So you're diversifying even your forage rotation. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's great. And uh, you know, I'm seeing it, the back half is a little bit more green than the front half. Uh, is there something going on there? Yes. Hey, good eye. Uh, so uh, in these plots, uh, the back half receives uh, manuring and the front half doesn't. So it's, it's randomized throughout here, but we split these plots back in 2007 in the fall and we left this front half has never had any amendments uh, and the back half has. And what we use is a third count composted beef cattle manure, a third anaerobic digestate and a third insect frass. Okay. Yeah. And then we follow this with wheat. Okay, so let's move over to the wheat crop. So, here's the forage rotation organic wheat crop, which I think looks pretty great. Um, this year has been a great year for Glenlee yields, I'm guessing. Uh, and I'm guessing that the front half the halfback was uh, the manure added portion. That's that's correct. The the manure, the back half you can see is taller, and uh, that's that's historically where the manure is added, and we do get a yield boost from that most years. Okay. Do you yeah. have do you have higher weed um, populations back there? Um, in the wheat, uh, well, let me just talk a bit about the weeding. What we do here is we do one cultivation between the rows. Okay. And uh, we've been using our wheel hose up till now, okay. but a little later I'll show you our new camera guided machine, okay. which we'll start employing last next year. There are weeds in there, there's, uh, there's thistle, and the other weed implement we use is a comb cut, which cuts the thistles out of the wheat, and actually it's quite effective, because that, that, was, that was quite a bit of thistle there, so, and you don't see a lot. So when you put the comb cut through there, at what stage was the wheat? The wheat's about that tall, and our idea is to put the knives of the comb cut in about that far. Okay. So they cut off, hopefully, the thistles below the top of the wheat. The wheat is growing one centimeter a day, and so it quickly overpowers the thistle. Okay. So if you have a competitive wheat crop and you get a good cut on the thistle, it can, it can really suppress it. So would you suggest increasing seeding rates if you know you're going to do some kind of uh, in-season weed cultivation? That, that's a really good idea, Michelle. And you know, uh, it's something that we, we, we are increasing the seeding rate a little bit over our conventional, but we probably could go higher. Now, the, the downside of the increased seeding rate is you create a very dense canopy mm. with more humidity and more leaf disease. Mm. So, mm -hmm. um, now, you know, I'm gonna ask you a question now, sure. because now we're gonna enter your wheelhouse and that's variety development. Mm. And so uh, I'd like you to tell our audience a little bit about this, uh, this creature that we're looking at. Yeah, so if I could uh, remind you that in the annual conventional rotation we are growing Starbuck, which is the latest, greatest uh, semi-dwarf variety that a lot of farmers are growing here in Manitoba. In the organic rotation we try to uh, suit the varieties that we're growing in this rotation according to the growing environment. So, uh, you know, it's always a challenge to find something that does well in um, organic because there's no actual organic breeding program going on in Canada but uh, the lab has been uh, the natural systems agriculture lab has been involved in a breeding program called participatory plant breeding essentially we have partnered um, breeders from uh, Egg Canada to make the crosses and then we send out those diverse seed populations out to farmers um, so they will seed it on their own organic farm and then the farmer will actually make the selections on the organic farm. So we're not only diversifying the selection environment in a breeding program, but we're also diversifying the selector. So this line that we're standing in front of right now, it was selected under organic conditions and it was selected by an organic farmer. And um, I would say that it has like really great yield potential um, this year. Uh, and there's a lot of research that's uh, looked at how selection environment impacts its fi the final performance of the line in the um, targeted growing environment. So we're really excited. I believe this is the first or second year that we've grown a PPB. This is the second year we've grown a PPB line in the organic rotation. And uh, do you think you'll continue to grow a PPB line in this rotation going forward, Martin? Yeah, I think we will. Um because we're, that, that means that we're growing a variety that's selected for organic, it works well. 
um, this this particular variety um, uh, has performed well in the organic yield trials. So just for the audience's benefit, one of the things Michelle has done in her PhD is to evaluate all these farmer lines at a whole bunch of locations around the prairies and even even in Quebec and in Prince Edward Island. And uh, I think what we're moving toward is uh, switching from this one to uh, uh, the line of Terry Muro, uh, an organic, far a different organic farmer, and Michelle's work has shown that that variety is particularly good. So, but yes, we are going to uh, continue to grow organic lines in the organic system. So that kind of creates some confounding because people say, well, you know, you could put Starbuck in here and Starbuck in there, then you'd compare apples and apples, right? Mm -hmm. But they are two different systems. And in the oats, Michelle, we're going to be, um, we're looking at including a farmer line for the organic instead of using Suris or Justice or whatever new oat variety or maybe even Summit, uh, which would be used in the conventional, we'll use that farmer line. And that comes from a farmer uh, selector from northern Alberta. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about how far that line has gone actually in some of the co-op trials in, a, in the conventional oh, breeding world. You know, I think you know as much or more about it than I do, so I'm going to leave the mic with you. Okay, so I mean, uh, the breeder that we uh, worked with for the, the PPBO program was Dr. Jennifer Mitchell Fetch. She's since retired, uh, but she took a whole bunch of the PPB lines and stuck them in her own yield trials and has uh, the, the PPB line that we want to incorporate in the Glenlee rotation has actually moved all the way up to the co-op trials in, in the conventional side. So there is possibly a potential that it could, it could be registered with breeder backup. Uh, so that's really exciting, and I think that that um, shows the demonstrates the potential of a PPB program for organic in, in Canada if we have uh, good infrastructure support. So Michelle, are you saying uh, that the PPB or participatory plant breeding uh, uh, crop could actually yield a commercial variety uh, in the commercial registration system? Uh, that's that's here's hoping. Okay. That'd be very exciting. Okay. Here's hoping. So we do know we, we have one line that's actively being grown in co-op trials across the prairies. And would that be the first in Canada? That would be the first in Canada. Okay. So, so you've pretty heard about exciting. A possible Canadian. Possible. First. Okay. So now we're standing in the flax phase of the uh, perennial organic rotation. So just as a reminder, it's two years of alfalfa, wheat, and then flax. Um, and so uh, I don't know. I can kind of tell between the back half and the front half. There's a bit more weeds in this front half than the back half. Uh, would you agree, Martin? Yes, um, we always, we, what we see here is, is where we add manure in the flax crop, we definitely have more weeds. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it looks like the flax at the back half, it's a bit shorter. It's not nearly as um, you know, healthy as the front, but the back definitely has less weeds. And I would say that the majority of the weeds at the front is a lot of red root pigweed, uh, whereas the back, um, there isn't as much pigweed. Uh, why would that be? Okay, well, uh, red root pigweed is a non-mycorrhizal weed, as, as well as we know. Uh, it, it does not have these beneficial fungi, and so it does very poorly where there's low phosphorus. And okay. the reason, uh, and flax is highly mycorrhizal, so it can get phosphorus even when the soil phosphorus level is very low. Okay. And so um, we don't see the red root pigweed in there because it can't get phosphorus. Here it's got phosphorus from the manure mm -hmm. and so it does better. So the flax is able to compete with the pigweed much better when it's very low phosphorus because it just has that competitive advantage. That's right, through the mycorrhiza. Very cool. And here is the thing for the height test. Okay. Now this looks... Got it. I don't know. It looks oh, about the same as the annual, Yeah, I would say. Yep. Yeah, the flax in the organic system this year um, looks probably better than the conventional. Hmm. And uh, why do you think that might be, actually, if I can throw that a comprehensive exam question back to the PhD student? Oh, uh, that's a good question. 
Well, I would say that at least in the low phosphorus, uh, the um, flax is, like we talked about, it's extremely mycorrhizal. It's, it makes those associations with fungi to access phosphorus in uh, surface areas of the soil that it wouldn't otherwise be able to. Um, and in the conventional rotation, it could be that it was, um, the flax can get a little bit lazy. Um, and so it, it could be that the, um, it just didn't do as well in conventional. Okay, so by lazy you're saying it may not have as much association with these beneficial fungi. Right. And why would that be in the conventional? Oh, well, that's because uh, there has to be a certain amount of need from the crop to actually signal to the mycorrhizal oh. to invite them into the roots. Okay. So. And it's not happening in the conventional because we're adding phosphorus fertilizer. Okay. Correct. Okay, so um, that's a great answer. I think that would have been really good in the exam. The other thing that we've learned is from April Stainsby's master's work is that the soil health in the organic system is a little bit better. It oh. has better aggregate stability. And, and do you think that that's because that we, they don't use synthetic fertilizer, they don't use chemicals, or is it the forage? Yeah, well, even the conventional forage, where we have exactly the same rotation, we've got some soil health benefits here. I don't know, I mean, we've speculated on why that is. Could it be the greater plant diversity because we've got more weeds? We don't have a killer amount of weeds here, but we've got some, and that just adds a little diversity. Hmm. Uh, the other thing is, uh, the, we have more live root days in the organic systems because we have a little bit of weed growth after harvest, but the conventional, it's often very, very non-weedy because we've killed the plants. Uh, and farmers are doing that with pre-harvest glyphosate and stuff. So those could be some reasons. Oh, that's interesting. I never really thought about weeds as being some kind of cover crop. Yeah, yeah and you know, our, our colleague, Dr. Rob Golden at the University of Manitoba has been looking at how much do weeds contribute to soil health in terms of uh, because we know that the roots of plants is really what drives soil health. Mm, mm. But uh, um, I think we should let our audience go. I'm going to give you one last chance at a question if you have one uh, <laughs> oh. or a comment. Well, I was going to comment that we spend so much time looking at the cash crops that we do grow that we haven't, there hasn't been a lot of work looking at the weeds that grow and what benefit they may apply to soil health. Not yeah. so much yield, but soil health. Yeah, and that reminds me of a story of uh, Alfred Bernier at the uh, Feeble Institute in Switzerland. I, I went uh, uh, there many years ago and I, I, I looked at his fall rye crop and he said, see those weeds down there, Martin? He said, we want about a thousand kilograms per hectare of weed dry matter in our cro organic crops because they feed the soil. And I had never thought about that. Mm -hmm. I was always thinking, let's kill the weeds. Right. That'll make the best situation. Right. And we don't want the weeds to overpower the crop. Right. But if we look at this situation uh, across this plot, uh, I mean, we've been on many organic farm tours, right? Mm -hmm. What would, would the farmers be worried about this? I wouldn't say they would be worried about this, no. And it does create a little bit more dockage, but the yield potential is still very high. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a couple of uh, things to show uh, on the machinery row. So thank you, Michelle, for joining me in the crop rotation part of it oh, and you. happy to co-host. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's go over and take a look at some of the machines that we're working with. Cool. All right, welcome back. We're in the uh, equipment portion of the video. Uh, what are we standing in front of, Martin? Well, this, this uh, is our exciting new uh, uh, early generation robotic weeder. It's a Garford. Um, and what happens is it, it, it cultivates between the rows, but the unique thing about this is the rows can be like six inches or 15 centimeters apart, and it goes right between the rows. And uh, uh, we will uh, link to a video which shows this thing in operation. Um, and so this has just been moved to the Glenlea rotation, and we're going to start using it in our organic systems next year. So uh, it's camera guided. Um, and, you know, how can the camera distinguish between the rows and weeds and what are the challenges of that? Okay, so this, the camera goes here and it shines down on three rows. There's a console on the tractor and then this is hooked to the tractor on the three-point hitch and then this part here moves side to side to keep the thing between the rows. Uh -huh. And um, a lot of people ask, couldn't you do that with GPS? And you can't. You need the camera to 
because we're going two centimeters from the row with the cultivator. Mm. Uh, and so uh, there must be some crop damage. I mean, in some cases, it must kind of get out of sync with the, where the rows are, especially if the weeds get out of hand. Well, I mean, we have uh, worked in pretty weedy conditions, and it does stay between the row. Okay. Uh, you know, the, 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 the camera also picks up the different colors of the plant. It, it picks up those three rows. If it only picked up one row, I think it'd be a problem, and that's maybe why it picks up three. Okay. Uh, but we've had really good success with this. And there's a whole bunch of tools that you can put on this, like finger weeders and other things. Okay. And so what crops do you hope to use uh, in the Glenley rotation? All of them. All of them. All of them. Okay. Because all of these crops, let's just go over and look at our cedar here. Michelle, it's right next door. Uh, and if we get the camera going directly into the machine, we can see the row spacing of the, uh, of the crop. These rows are six inches apart or 15 centimeters. Mm -hmm. And people will say, well, you know, we've been uh, interrow cultivating corn and sugar beets forever. It, that's true, but we haven't, at least in the last, uh, in Canadian agriculture, cultivated between the rows of narrow row crops. Mm -hmm. And that's really the game changer with that machine. Mm -hmm. And so can you see conventional farmers using this? You know, I think so. As uh, herb You know, it, it depends on the economics, on the scale of the equipment, but one of the organic farmers that we've been working with in Steinbach, they've got a, a unit like this, which is, I think, 45 feet wide, which is as wide as their air seeder. Okay. And so that opens up that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's very exciting. Yeah. So what other pieces of equipment Well, let's go over to Equipment Alley. Okay. Take a look at some more weeding equipment. I'll see you over there. Okay, we'll see you over there. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Now we're in uh, Equipment Alley of Glenley. Yeah. And uh, what are we standing in front of? What is this? This is a blade roller um, used to crimp cover crops. So this is what we used in the barley hairy vetch in the rotation. Okay. Um, and so why, why would you crimp it? What's the point? Um, the idea is to uh, terminate uh, the green manure from growing. And uh, what are the ways that we typically used to do that? With tillage, mm -hmm. with you know equipment and exposing the soil, using lots of diesel fuel. Mm -hmm. And so um, we've known for a long time that farmers in the tropics would grow cover crops and then would, would uh, just uh, run over them with like a log being pulled behind a mule. And I've seen that with my own eyes in Honduras. And the Brazilians came up with sort of this concept to get a bit more scientific about it, where this would roll across the field and these would not cut the plant, they would just crimp it like a, like a hay bind uh -huh. and that would kill the plant and lay it down. Nice. And so this is a way to incorporate some no-till concepts into an organic rotation. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. This, this, that's right. So we, we, uh, in the case of the barley hairy vetch, this kills the barley, uh, but it doesn't kill the hairy vetch. So we're also using it as a selective tool. Very um, yeah, and it, it will also uh, crimp the top of thistles. Okay. And the, the only thing is the plants have to be at least about, you know, 16 inches tall, hopefully taller, hopefully like this, so that you get a couple of crimps into the stem. And, and maybe you'd want to time the, uh, the development to flowering when it's... Uh, vulnerable or does that matter? Yeah, there's all those considerations. If you're looking at fall rye, you right. can deal with that. And there's lots of videos on crimper rollers, but this is one in the flesh. Great. And so what, what do we have here beside you? Okay, so this is the plot version of our uh, comb cut. You can hold it. I can okay. a good little workout, mm -hmm. okay? So this is the comb cut. Um, we have a bigger version and we have a YouTube video of that. But basically uh, what we do is we have this slide through the wheat there are knives here, and those knives, you can see they've actually cut some clover here. They'll, they'll cut the thistle, but the, the wheat leaves will slide right through. And so it gives us some selective weed control of broad-leaved weeds in a cereal crop. You wouldn't use this in soybeans or flax, mm -hmm. but you can use it in cereals like oats, wheat, rye, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you also use this above the crop later on in the season? Yeah, you could, but then I would recommend a swather because it's just more efficient. Okay. It cuts better. Okay. And I should add that this was actually built by an agriculture student who took the organic course. Okay. And instead of writing an essay, uh, they designed this. So those of you who want to take the course, you know, come into class and you can use your welder to get your final mark. 
<laughs> Great. Now there's more equipment I'd like to show you. Okay. And one is right here. If we just spin the camera over to the wide blade right here. This is um, the famous noble blade. And if you, you're standing on the edge of the blade there and I'm standing on the edge of the blade there. So the cultivator shovel is that wide. And the idea is that this would just slip under the soil surface and cut the weeds and leave the residue on the surface. Mm -hmm. So it's a conservation tool for organic agriculture. Mm. And so uh, is this uh, widely used or? Yeah, it's yeah. very widely used in like southern Saskatchewan. This is a traditional tool. Cool. So organic farmers do use these. They've got units that are, you know, 60 feet wide. Okay. And uh, you just change these knives once every generation and away you go. So now let's talk about weed control in the growing crop. The, um, you know, a lot of uh, people that are new to organic grain farming, uh, you know, and, and that would certainly have included me at the beginning is, well, we're not going to use herbicides, but we're just going to harrow the crop and get rid of some of our broadleaf weeds. And so does it work? Yes, it does work. It's part of an integrated package. So uh, if we look at a farm right now, what type of harrows would farmers have laying around? Maybe a diamond tooth harrow like this. Maybe a, a heavy duty harrow for spreading a residue. And those harrows can work in certain crops, especially in pulses. Peas and lentils are very resistant to aggressive harrowing things like even the diamond harrow. We've had work here where we've harrowed faba beans when they're about that tall and it was a very good way of getting the broad-leaved weeds out of it uh, when they're very small and, and, and the faba beans were incredibly resistant. But now we've gone to more sophisticated tools so we'll just uh, swing the camera over here and this is an example of a tine harrow that is um, got very, very um, small springy tines with little, you can see little hooks on them and they're adjustable. You can adjust them in different ways and you can get these in very wide versions. And this is a very important tool um, for taking small seeded broad leaves and even uh, green foxtail and barnyard grass when it's very, very small out of cereals and pulses and even soybeans. And so the tine harrow is um, a very useful tool, even in potato production. You can use this uh, to sweep across the plant, you know, just before the potatoes emerge out of the soil. You can take all those small seeded leaves, uh, weeds out of the, um, uh, out of the crop. Okay, so we're standing in front of this uh, spiky piece of equipment, really interesting. Uh, what, what is this, Martin? This is uh, called a, a rotative harrow and uh, it travels in that direction and these will turn like a disc and these are rubber uh, with steel uh, pegs mounted and they'll just sort of, depending on how they're adjusted, they'll just agitate the top of the, of the soil and kick out the little weeds. Okay, so would you do this before seeding or um, after seeding? Well, you know, this is a pretty new tool. Okay. And so we're just experimenting. Mm -hmm. uh, this year we've actually used it in the early springtime just to prepare soil for some organic wheat planting. Mm -hmm. uh, we have used it. Uh, we just published a paper looking at the tolerance of dry beans to this. And what we found is, you know, the dry beans could be this tall and you can go with, through with this machine, clean out the weeds, and we didn't do any damage to the dry beans. So we're still learning how to use this piece of equipment in, wow. the, in the Canadian context, mm -hmm. because there's, there's very few of them around. Mm -hmm. um, but I really like it because we've used the rotary hoe, which many farmers will know about. It just tracks in one direction, and then we use the weeding harrows, which go through, and they all do a good job. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you want something that kind of goes side to side a bit more. Mm -hmm. And that's what this does. And that's why the Austrian company, Einbeck, actually developed it. Okay, very cool. So that is the end of machine, well, the machinery alley continues, but I think we've given our viewing audience a good taste of what's out here. Mm -hmm. um, there's one last thing I wanna show you and it regards vegetables. Okay. Yeah, because we haven't talked much about organic vegetable production. So we're gonna take a break here and head over there. Great. Okay, so now we're standing in some vegetables. Uh, we've got some potato, some corn, 
some Swiss chard, uh, some peppers, and some tomatoes. Uh, what are we doing here? Well, you know, there's so little emphasis on research for organic vegetable producers. I just thought we'd throw a few of these in into different rotations. I'm not going to go through the background of all the little rotations here, but there's been different cover crop species. So, um, so uh, our team just planted these to see how they respond to cover crops, how they how they grow, mm -hmm. and uh, we have a similar sort of study at our Lebo site, mm -hmm. where we're looking at the residual effect of manure on these. And um, also, it really helps the summer students become who are agronomy students or agroecology students become a little bit more familiar with vegetable production mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we don't talk too much about uh, vegetables a lot when we're learning our basic agronomy classes. We talk more about cereals and cash crops. So yeah. this is uh, refreshing. It's cool. Yeah, to see. yeah. And in the what they call the you know all of the food guides. If you look at the food guides that are going on these days we're seeing that we are producing lots of cereal mm. but what we're producing not enough of is vegetables mm -hmm. vegetables and fruits mm -hmm. and so that's what we're not that potato and corn are the shining example of yeah of vegetables but you know certainly some of these are. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you had mentioned that there were some different uh, rotation uh, treatments within this experiment. Yeah. Um, are you noticing any differences between yeah, what, um, you know, I would say they're not profound okay. uh, because these are quite healthy soils. Yeah. But uh, we, don't, we do notice over there where we've had, again, uh, a green manure crop like mm -hmm. peas or vetch, mm -hmm. the potatoes are growing better, the corn's growing better. Mm -hmm. So no big surprise. Mm -hmm. And it's probably more nitrogen right. for those crops. Right, right. Yeah, not a surprise, but it's really, it's uh, good to see. It's a yeah. good demonstrative uh, Yeah, and, and for people in, uh, who are gardening, a lot of the principles that we talked about like green manuring and crop rotation, they apply to a garden as much as anything. For sure. Um, and so that crimper roller, uh, we actually have a garden sized version, which mm -hmm. we didn't show. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could grow a hairy vetch, create a mulch, mm -hmm. and then put your tomato or pepper transplant into that mulch the mm -hmm. following spring. We've done that, works very well. Oh, that's very cool. I want to show you an interesting plant. Okay. Not that these aren't interesting, we're just going to move over a little bit okay. here. And, uh, uh, you know, we all, we all have our secrets, and one of my uh, secrets is that I used to work with sugar beets. Oh, it's a sugar beet. And beets. that's Perhaps what this sure. is. No, okay. and so I'm going to see if I'm strong enough to pull one out, first of all, and that's questionable. So, if it actually comes out... Oh, coming. Oh. Okay, so there, there is a sugar beet, and this is not desirable. You don't want all these sprangles, uh, but... Um, the sugar beet is actually uh, represents uh, a family of plants that are used in organic production for green manures, for catch crops, for soil loosening. Right. So there's all kinds of different types of beets. There's fodder beets and right. Swiss chard, as you mentioned. You can use these like leaves. <laughs> yeah, you can use these leaves and things. Um, and so uh, we used to grow more sugar beets in Manitoba mm -hmm. as a sugar crop and they've disappeared for 30 years. Now they're making a comeback as a green manure. So I hear a lot about tillage radish being uh, what you would grow if you want to uh, you know, reduce the amount of compaction in your soil. Yeah. Um, but I haven't heard too much about sugar beets as a cover crop in one of those mixtures, um, but it would work just as well? It, its configuration really dictates how well it does biological the tillage of the soil. If you hold this, I'm going to try to pull out another one, see if we can get some, see if the conformation is any different, or if we're getting the same. Okay, so here we're getting more of a, you can drop that one and we can now focus on this one. This is more of the kind of a shape of a sugar beet that we would expect, mm. and it'll probably triple or quadruple in size before it's harvested. Wow. Um, the um, the 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 nice thing about the tillage radish is they are a, de a longer cylinder mm -hmm. and they're smaller. Mm -hmm. These are a little bit fat on top and then they taper down. Right. But they both have unique attributes. Okay. One of the really nice things about sugar beets is they're very salt tolerant. Okay. Um, and so they can be used in cover crops in saline areas. Okay. Very cool. And there we have our other vegetables. Um, we um, we've appreciated you coming and and uh, and helping co-host. So we have a gift for you. Uh, you know, we have a gift of a couple of tomatoes. Oh wow! And a pepper. You know these are. 
for the grad student wages, you know, so, you know, uh, checks <laughs> oh, in the mail. I can eat dinner tonight. Yeah, you can eat dinner tonight. So um, we're also getting really good production out of this. So I guess the point of this is just to emphasize that organic production um, is not only for cereals, but also for vegetables. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and as a, as a cook, as a professional cook yourself, mm -hmm. Um, you probably have some thoughts about using products that go right from the field to people's mouths. Oh yeah. Produced organically. Are mm -hmm. there, I mean, what are some of the advantages you might think about? Well, I mean, I don't think anybody can um, disagree that a tomato from the grocery store tastes extremely different from a, a local tomato that you would buy at your farmer's market. Okay. And so in terms of intensity of flavor, uh, when the actual vegetable is picked um, and how the, the sugars are, are um, uh, processed during storage and, and things like that, that really impacts the flavor of the final product. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I would also say that there's a lot of great, you know, varieties that we don't grow anymore um, that would really contribute to the, the culinary, um, uh, you know, landscape yeah. in uh, on the prairies. Now, um, you probably know of Carlo Leifert, uh, Dr. Leifert, at uh, a number of universities in Scotland and in Australia. He's done a lot of work on pesticide residues in plants. Mm -hmm. You know, what, uh, you know, do you want to comment on his research and how it might impact eating an organic vegetable as opposed to a chemically treated vegetable? Right. So, I mean, Carlo Leifert has done a lot of really interesting work looking at uh, the amount of pesticide residuals that are in the, the urine of uh, people who eat just organic and just conventional. I believe that uh, when they kind of sequestered um, people within a hotel room and had them only eat conventional or only eat um, organic uh, food, that they found that uh, I think the uh, pesticide residuals in the urine were quite a bit higher in the conventional versus the uh, organic. Yeah, and, and he's a very credible scientist, right? He's, oh, yeah. yes. Um, His papers are quite difficult to read sometimes because the he's so careful and the analysis is pretty complex, so. Yeah. So that, that's, that's, I mean, that's a very, you know, sort of striking story. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons why we're looking at, at helping the organic vegetable sector as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. so uh, any last comments before we leave our viewing audience to go about their business? Um, I, I just want to thank, uh, thank you, Martin, for showing me the Glen Reeve rotation. Um, I think this year, uh, with all of the, the moisture and the wonderful management um, by our technician, Sarah Wilcott, has really made this a banner year. Yeah, that's right. And I just want to echo that Sarah's professional work here really allows these to be managed in a way that's credible for farmers. And so, so thank you for joining me mm -hmm. and thank you for participating in our 2022 Glenlee uh, video series.